Hey there, thanks for tuning in today. I'm Dr. Morgan Nolte. I wanted to let you know that the video you're watching is a clip of a longer episode that's very in-depth about the best foods to eat to lower blood sugar. So if you're interested in learning more about that, I'll link the full video below in the description. Please be sure to subscribe to this channel, give the video a thumbs up, leave a comment, and share it with a friend if you find it helpful. Thanks for watching and enjoy this clip. Prediabetes is when your blood sugar is elevated, but not high enough to be considered in the diabetes range. Here's a chart that shows normal prediabetes and diabetes cutoffs for blood glucose and A1C. A normal fasting blood glucose is 70 to 99, or a hemoglobin A1C of 5.6 or less. Prediabetes is when your fasting blood glucose is 100 to 125, or an A1C of 5.7 to 6.4. Type 2 diabetes is when your fasting blood glucose is 126 or higher on two separate tests, or an A1C of 6.5 or greater. First, let's talk about what prediabetes actually is and different tests for prediabetes. Once we discuss the tests, I'll also share some symptoms of prediabetes too. Let me share an email I received recently from someone that highlights the importance of this episode and why it's critical that you take responsibility for your health and that you know your numbers. I removed some details from the email to make it more anonymous. This person wrote, I have been tracking my food intake, but not my blood glucose levels because my doctor said that since my A1C was under seven, that I didn't need to worry about it. During the last three to four months, I decided I wanted to check my daily fasting glucose level in the morning. I discovered that I was getting numbers from 140 to 165 and occasional, occasionally up to 190. At my recent checkup, my A1C was 5.9. Can you explain my dilemma and what I should do now? In a nutshell, she lost a little bit of weight tracking calories, but she wasn't sure what the next step to take was to really optimize her blood sugars and continue her weight loss. This episode will answer that question. I want to highlight that this person's doctor said not to worry about her A1C until it was seven. As you just learned, that's half a point above the diabetic cutoff. Her doctor said not to worry about her blood sugar until she was already diabetic. My guess is because that's the point when the doctor would actually do something in the form of prescribing a medication. But there are so many changes that can be made proactively to prevent the need for medication altogether. Our medical system just isn't set up well to prevent disease. When you only have five to 10 minutes with your doctor, they don't have the time to sit down and explain to you what it actually takes to lower blood sugar. They do have time to write a prescription. And I know this time crunch frustrates doctors too because most get into the profession to help people. So if you have high blood sugar, I highly recommend you consider joining my online program Zibli because it's going to give you the information your doctor either doesn't know or doesn't have time to share with you to lower your blood sugar, like the doctor of the person who sent me that email. Another test that's a little more involved than the fasting blood sugar or A1C test is the oral glucose tolerance test or OGTT. Glucose tolerance refers to how well your body processes glucose or sugar after being given a measured dose, usually 75 grams orally. 75 grams of glucose is the equivalent amount of sugar that would be in almost two cups of pasta or one and three quarters of a cup of white rice. Normally what happens when you have a bolus of glucose like this is your blood sugar goes up and then comes back down over the next several hours. But if you have prediabetes or type two diabetes, your blood sugar takes longer to come back down. Here are the cutoffs for the oral glucose tolerance test two hours after consuming 75 grams of glucose. A blood glucose under 140 milligrams per deciliter is considered normal. A blood glucose of 140 to 199 milligrams per deciliter indicates you may have prediabetes, sometimes referred to as impaired fasting glucose. 
a blood glucose of greater or equal to 200 milligrams per deciliter indicates you may have diabetes. The oral glucose tolerance test is actually where my obsession with nutrition started. I failed my OGTT when I was pregnant with my son Dawson. I got a 141 and I was so mad. I felt like I should know better. I took that failed test seriously and started to learn as much as I could about nutrition and insulin resistance. And that's what I get to share with you now. As I mentioned, fasting insulin can predict type two diabetes up to two decades before fasting glucose. Insulin is the hormone that helps allow blood glucose to move from your blood into your cells. Your pancreas can only produce so much insulin. Over time, the amount of insulin required to keep your blood sugars normal goes up and up. With the rising level of insulin in your blood, your cells become resistant to its effect. So this upward regulation where your blood sugars go up after a meal, that normal amount of insulin is released, but your cells are less sensitive to insulin's effect because of the insulin resistance. So more insulin is secreted to keep blood sugars in the normal range. But over time, you become more and more resistant and your pancreas reaches its capacity at how much insulin it can produce. Insulin can no longer keep blood sugar down. So that's when we start to see prediabetes. Dr. Pradnip Jamadas talks about the Kraft test. This is a combination test that measures both glucose and insulin response following a meal. The Kraft test can catch prediabetes even before your blood glucose level because it also tests the insulin in the background that's actually responsible for controlling your blood glucose. High insulin levels are associated with all the same conditions as type two diabetes, things like cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, dementia, inflammation, blindness, and peripheral neuropathy. So let me explain how the Kraft test is a step up from the oral glucose tolerance test and will catch prediabetes by looking at a person's insulin response instead of just their fasting glucose response. For the Kraft test, you drink 75 grams of glucose. Then your glucose and insulin are measured at the half hour, one, two, and three hour marks to make the curves and see the relationships between a person's glucose and insulin response. A prediabetic could still have a relatively normal blood glucose response. In people with a healthy insulin response, you should see the insulin curve following the blood glucose curve. But in someone who has prediabetes, the insulin curve will be higher because more insulin is needed. This is because the cells are less sensitive to insulin's effect. Their body is a little insulin resistant, but their insulin can still keep up and that brings the blood sugar level down but eventually their body won't be able to make enough insulin to keep up and they will have impaired fasting glucose or prediabetes. This 2017 research study backs this claim up and says that using fasting glucose, oral glucose tolerance test or A1C may not be the most effective early screening tool for type two diabetes. Incorporating fasting insulin and especially insulin after an oral glucose tolerance test as enhanced screening methods may help to increase the ability to detect diabetes and prediabetes, allowing earlier intervention to prevent diabetic complications. Most prediabetics also struggle with weight gain or at least poor body composition. That means lower muscle mass and higher fat mass. That's because insulin is the primary hormone responsible for body weight. A rise in fat mass is a direct cause of insulin resistance because insulin is the hormone responsible for making this stuff. Then this fat releases a hormone called leptin. Over time, as your insulin goes up, your fat goes up and your leptin goes up. You become resistant not only to insulin, but also to leptin. Leptin works to counteract the effects of ghrelin or your hunger hormone. So the negative feedback loop that's supposed to keep you at a healthy weight becomes broken. Leptin stops inhibiting ghrelin and you sense hunger and eat 
even though you have plenty of fat for fuel on your body. The best way to fix this and restore a healthy body fat and weight is to start at the source, lower insulin resistance. You've heard the phrase, when the tide comes in, all the boats rise. While in your body, insulin is the tide. When we focus on lowering insulin, all your other risk factor numbers improve. Triglycerides go down, blood pressure goes down, HDL cholesterol goes up, glucose goes down, body fat comes down, especially the unhealthy visceral belly fat that's inflammatory. So when we're looking at hidden symptoms of prediabetes, what we are actually focusing on are the hidden symptoms of insulin resistance and elevated blood sugars, because that is what's driving your diabetes. According to the Centers for Disease Control, or CDC, approximately 88 million American adults, more than one in three, have prediabetes. Of those with prediabetes, more than 84% don't know they have it. So it's safe to say the most common symptom of prediabetes would be no symptoms at all. At least none they recognize as being related to prediabetes, but they are. One symptom of prediabetes is weight gain, specifically a gain in fat mass. As I mentioned, your insulin is not only responsible for regulating blood sugars, but also your weight. Excessive hunger can also be a symptom of prediabetes, especially carb and sugar cravings. Cells that are resistant to insulin will sense a bit of starvation and increase your hunger, especially for foods that are known to give quick energy, the refined carbs. Excessive thirst can be a symptom of prediabetes. This increased fluid intake can also cause increased urination, which can be another symptom of prediabetes. Elevated blood pressure is a common symptom of prediabetes. High insulin directly causes high blood pressure. For some, high blood pressure may be the first sign of insulin resistance or prediabetes. They may just not have heard the link before. Dr. Bickman explains how insulin resistance causes high blood pressure in his book, Why We Get Sick. For those watching on YouTube, you can pause the video and check out this picture from Dr. Bickman's book that outlines five ways insulin resistance contributes to high blood pressure. If you haven't already, go buy that book. Fatigue is a common symptom of prediabetes. There are a lot of different potential causes for this fatigue, but a major one are the blood sugar spikes and dips that result from grazing on carbs. Your body is using a lot of energy just trying to balance your blood sugars. Other symptoms of high blood sugar are blurred vision, or numbness and or tingling in your hands or your feet. This is called peripheral neuropathy and it can be very painful and limit activity. Frequent infections are another sign of prediabetes. High blood sugar impairs the white blood cell function critical to a healthy immune system. And sugar is a great source of energy for invading bacteria and fungi. These factors increase the risk of infections of all kinds and impair the immune system so it takes longer to heal. Upper respiratory infections and urinary tract infections are two of the more common infections. If you notice you're getting them more often, consider that a warning sign to check your blood sugar and get them under control if you need to. In line with this impaired immune response would be slow healing wounds. That's why people with diabetes, especially those with peripheral neuropathy who may not be able to feel well must be vigilant about visually inspecting their feet for cuts and catch and treat them early. Diabetic foot wounds can be very hard to heal and lead to amputations of toes or unfortunately, sometimes their foot or a part of their leg. The last symptom I wanted to cover here is brain fog or confusion. Your brain is sensitive to insulin too. In fact, Alzheimer's disease is now being called type three diabetes. So for those of you who are motivated to keep your cognitive health as you age, I hope knowing there is a strong association between diabetes and dementia gives you strong, sustained motivation to prioritize your health, especially around menopause as estrogen drops, which causes insulin resistance to go up, you're going to be at an increased risk of developing prediabetes or progressing into diabetes. 
So the years surrounding menopause are an especially critical time in a woman's life to get blood sugars under control. I don't say this to scare you, but this is the reality that I saw every single day in geriatric physical therapy. You can either make time for your health now or make time for being sick down the road. Those are your only two options. And if you do get sick, you'll be able to handle that so much better with a higher baseline of health. You're either moving toward better health or worse health with every decision you make. Very few people like to talk about what geriatric medicine actually looks like. And honestly, it can be very sad to see nice, kind people suffering from conditions that were largely preventable. That's why I'm so passionate about creating this content and helping you have a trusted source of information. Just to summarize, the major signs of prediabetes are impaired fasting glucose, which can be determined from a fasting blood glucose of 100 to 125, a blood glucose of 140 to 199, two hours after drinking 75 grams of glucose for the oral glucose tolerance test, a hemoglobin A1C of 5.7 to 6.4, or an exaggerated insulin response even with a normal blood glucose response during the craft test. The symptoms of prediabetes were weight or fat mass gain, more hunger or thirst, increased urination, increased blood pressure, increased infections, reduced wound healing time, blurry vision, brain fog, fatigue, and peripheral neuropathy, which is numbness and or tingling in your hands and or feet, that may or may not be painful.